Commodity prices tend to go through extended periods of boom and bust, known as super cycles. These super cycles are extremely rare events. The last generally accepted super cycle started probably in the late 90s before peaking about a decade ago and was driven by rapid growth mainly in China and other emerging market economies. Goldman Sachs Global Head of Commodities Research, Jeff Curry, who has been a prominent advocate of an oil super cycle in the early 2000s, is now once again predicting a new super cycle in commodities. Jeff joins me now to discuss this in more detail. Hello, Jeff. Welcome to the program. Explain to our viewers first what defines a super cycle. Well, I've come to the conclusion that a super cycle is nothing other than a capex cycle. Um, where you have large scale investment. And if we think about the two super cycles that we observed over the last 70 years, one occurred between 1968 and 1980 for 12 years. Um, many people are familiar with that one. The other one occurred 2002 through 2014, ironically also 12 years. But when you look at a chart of global CapEx divided by global GDP to capture a CapEx cycle, and you overlay that with metals prices over the last 70 years, the two correspond perfectly, which is telling you really what's happening here is you have large scale um, investment. And the way we're beginning to think about it is don't think about it from the commodities, but think about it from the equities mm. instead. What does the 1960s, the 1990s, and the 2010s all have in common. They were very large new economy equity bubbles. It was the Nifty 50 in the 60s, which at that point in time, new economy was Coca-Cola. It was brands like right. LVMH is today. And in the 1990s, it was the dot-com boom. And in the 2010s, it was the FANG boom. But what they all did was they choked off capital to the old economy, hmm. meaning oil, gas, metals, mining, and the rest of them, such that they were very underinvested as you went into the 70s or in the 2000s and, or into the 2020s. And all it took was a demand event. Demand event in 1968 was LBJ's Great Society. The demand event in the 2000s was China's admission to the WTO. And the demand event this time was COVID stimulus. But they all did the same thing. Draw down inventories, exhaust spare capacity, and leave the market very vulnerable to future demand growth. Well, Jeff, this is probably how these cycles are all alike. But what are the, fa uh, the factors uh, you think uh, are, makes this super cycle different to the last one? Okay, when we think about the underinvestment component on the supply side, um, they all had the, the lack of investment going into the demand boom. Um, what one is going to make this one more complicated is the overlay of environmental policy that makes it very difficult to attract capital into the sector. You know, I like to point out, you look at, you know, oil prices, you look at um, metals prices, commodities were up. You know, 26% last year and the year before, 42%. The return in energy equities was 60%. Yet what happened to real CapEx over the course of the last year? It went down. It went down in 2021 as well. Mm. So we're not getting that response in investment that you would typically get. I do want to put a caveat here. If you go back to the cycle in the 2000s, the prices moved in 02. The CapEx didn't come to 05. People simply did not believe in the sustainability of the story, very similar to what they are right now. It's hard, you know, and I don't know if it's ESG related or if it is people have a bad taste in their mouth of oil and commodities. Let's not forget, energy sector destroyed 54 cents on every dollar invested over the previous decade. And that's entrenched in many investors' minds. Mm -hmm. Well, Jeff, some would point out that a super cycle requires three indicators, surging demand, surging prices and surging supply, all in tandem. And they would argue that the commodities markets currently fail all three tests. How would you respond to this? Um, I find surging supply a difficult argument because the 70s was underinvestment across the entire space. 
the 2000s, underinvestment across the entire space, and today, underinvestment across the entire space. So I don't buy into the surging supply. Let's go to the um, to the question about surging demand. Mm. Yes, you had surging demand in 1968 with LBJ's Great Society, but throughout the 70s, it started to taper off. By the way, for, for many of your listeners, I like to remind people the first attempt at an OPEC oil embargo occurred in 1967. There wasn't enough demand to make it work. Mm. It didn't work until 73 after five years of LBJ's Great Society. What about the 2000s? It was China's admission to the WTO. What about the current environment? Um, yeah, I like to point out COVID was a crisis of inequalities, and it forced governments around the world to focus on the disadvantaged groups. And as a result, we saw stimulus directed at lower income houses, and lower income households consume far more commodities than higher income ones. And as a result, we saw a big surge in demand. And a lot of people will say to me, well, this all disappeared with, um, with COVID. No, look at Europe. You know, it's basically levying windfall profit taxes, taking the, the proceeds from those taxes and giving them as subsidies to lower income groups in terms of energy consumption, keeping the demand picture much stronger. So, um, you know, people like to say there's not a demand component to this. Um, yes, there is. And when we think about um, metals, um, think about all that EV demand. That's going to be your big capex mm. boom. Like, well, we think about what was China. China was a metals demand boom to go construct all those cities. This one's going to be a metals demand boom to go construct um, EVs and decarbonization and green technologies, um, very similar to what China was. In fact, we argue that the demand for green CapEx this decade is bigger than the demand for CapEx during the China boom years of the 2000s. And then the decade after that, it's two times China. So um, I really push back against the there's not demand for commodities. Mm. Uh, it's going to be enormous amount of demand for commodities um, going forward. And, you know, your other point about surging prices, let's look at what prices have done over the course of the last um, two years since we've been calling for a commodity super cycle. You know, oil um, you know, is up um, roughly about 2x and metals are up always 2x. Again, let's go back, returns from commodities in 2021 for 42%. And in 2022, um, they were, um, you know, 26%. Those are big numbers. True. But Jeff, would the commodity super cycle be affected if the world accelerates its transition to low carbon energies? And what happens whether it goes back to double down on fossil fuels? Well, I mean, you, I, I like to point out that the pariah commodities, um, which are, you know, let's take coal and tobacco. Um, look where their prices are today right now, where they were um, you know, previously just shot to the moon because of underinvestment in supply. So by you know, arguing that you're going to get the decarbonization demand, you got to look at both the supply side and the demand side. Nobody invested in coal. Nobody invested in tobacco. And you know, demand did moderate in both of these commodities, um, yet prices went substantially higher um, because of the underinvestment thesis. But I also want to talk about um, on, you know, on the demand side. Um, and, you know, we look at oil, oil demand is likely to reach a new all time high this year. Um, you know, coal demand. Yeah, we're energy transitioning. But what did we transition into last year was coal. Um, and so when we look at that, you know, I, by the way, I want to emphasize I'm a big believer. We need to do something about climate change. And it's incredibly important. But current policies are not leading to the decline in demand that many have been forecasting. Mm. And we, we argue ultimately to take like a carbon price or a carbon tax to make it so expensive that, you know, people do not engage in these activities. Um, but I think it's important to remember, yeah, we believe you will see a hit to demand. But, you know, at the earliest, you're going to slow demand growth rates down in the middle of this decade, and you won't see the, the peak oil demand, meaning it tip over mm. um, until the early 2030s. That's a long time from now. Um, and we don't have the investment, which means you have demand going this way, supply going that direction, which means you're in a structural deficit, whether if it is oil or it is the metals. And let's not forget when you have these big capex booms, they're very stimulant to the rest of they provide stimulus to the rest of the economy. Which then you got to have all the oil for you know all the activities going on to build this. So uh, yeah, that's why you know I think it's 
premature to call to call for the the eulogy of, of oil right mm. now. Mm. Jeff, could higher for longer interest rates globally suffocate the super cycle be before it can really lift off? How big of a downside risk is this, you think? It is exactly what needs to happen. Think mm. about this. When interest rates are zero, what do investors focus on? Long-term growth opportunities, pie-in-the-sky investments, crypto, all of that was what the focus was on, you know, in the you know, in, in, in the in the 2010s or you know 1990s, what were they focused on? The the long term dot com boom. Or what were they focused on in the, in the 1960s? Coca Cola brand growth in these. So the growth long term growth prospects are the focus with zero percent interest rates. And what higher interest rates are telling you, you bring the focus in near term. You become short duration focused. Another way to say it is higher interest rates make putting a drill bit in the ground more profitable than un, you know, thinking about long-term tech opportunities. Another way to say it, higher interest rates are telling you you need to make investments in near-term activities. Um, you know, I, I, by the way, emissions are up um, you know, pretty much, you know, we think, argue, 4.3% last year mm. because people are not focused, they're focused on 2050 emissions, not near-term emissions. And the same thing about as interest rates go up, higher interest rates means you need to make choices. And when you make choices, you have to think about what do we need to do today to de-bottleneck the system to allow for growth? And so I, I think that, that that question is another way to think of is missing the point. Another way to think about this is higher interest rates make that long-term tech story not very interesting, mm. but they make the near-term oil, metals, agriculture, and these old economy boring assets far more interesting in a higher rate environment. And let's think about what happened in the 1970s, higher rates and more investment. You know, what happened in the 2000s, higher rates, more investment. Um, and you can, so you can think about higher rates um, mean a better return in the physical world than in the financial world. And that's the world we're heading into. And probably that goes to your point of that dynamics of capital flows moving from the new economy back to the old um, uh, economy. Um, uh, let's let's remain with the uh, medium term long term story here jeff if one is holding for a period of let's say 2 to 3 years where specifically should this investor be within the commodity space you think energy metals or agricultural um i would argue you want to own all three in fact you look at a a, a investment vehicle like the bcom and bloomberg commodity index it's very equal weighted across all of them where we don't have to make a sector call. Um, you know, that's the thing is sometimes metals look better. I'd argue metals look better right now today than energy, but energy will probably look better than metals six to 12 months from now. Um, so if you're thinking about holding over a longer term horizon, owning something like a diversified commodity index, such as the BCOM index, I think is a much uh, more prudent vehicle. Hmm. Okay, let's move um, to the more short-term uh, stories here. Uh, Russian oil supply has proven resilient from the second quarter uh, up until November of last year. But in the last month or two, it seems that the price cap has been biting. In light of current inventory levels, how do you see the upcoming products ban playing out in the market? And would you expect prices to spike post-February 5th? Yeah, you know, our, our base case is we we likely to see around 600,000 barrels per day of supply lost due to frictions in the inability to redirect products. Redirecting crude is relatively easy. You go find a scrap tanker somewhere in the world, get Chinese insurance, fill it up, move it to some place like India, create the products and move the products back to Europe or the US. Mm. You can't do that trick with products because they're already you know in use finished products. And as a result, we don't have the transportation. It's going to be far more difficult to redirect products like we, we saw with crude. And so we'd expect to see the frictions lead to around a 600,000 barrel per day decline in supply. Finally, uh, European natural gas inventories have been lifted after a warmer winter thus far, relaxing the gas-driven constraints on European economic growth. But with Russian pipeline gas curtailed, Jeff, for many months now, and LNG imports replacing only a fraction of that, 
Surely next winter will be the real test for Europe. Do you expect gas prices to retest the 2022 highs once again later this year? Um, I think retesting the 2022 highs will be difficult um, mm. as we look into the winter 2024 period. Um, we do think you'll regain, re resume tightness in that winter period, barring again another warm winter. Um, but I think the more important point for oil and metals and everything is Europe has a runway now before it runs into problems. It can make it about a year. And I, you know, I, the other important point that you didn't bring up, I would put it way above Russia, is mm. China. What was the biggest event that occurred to commodities in 2022? Mm. It was China, not sure. Russia. China, the world's largest commodity consumer, the world's largest oil importer, the second largest economy in the world, shut down. Um, and the loss in demand from China was three times that of the potential losses out of Russia. And so when we think about what is the biggest event happening to commodities in the global economy um, right now, right here today, is the China reopening. reopening. Yeah, absolutely. And in, in going back to Europe, it's going to pull Europe along. We know Europe's a big provider of capital goods into China. And so by taking the energy shackles off of Europe, you're opening up the opportunity for China to not only create strength domestically and for the rest of the the world there, but also to, you know, help utilize the excess capacity in Europe that was previously shut down due to energy problems. So mm -hmm. the outlook, the runway in Europe, in China over the course of the next six, 12 months is, is pretty a positive. Jeff, that's all the time we've got. It was a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you very much. Great. You bet. All the best. Take care. Thank you.